Now we come to perhaps one of the most important statements in our text thus far. It's kind of uh, uh, sounds the basic theme of Anthony's journey, which is conceived as a spiritual combat with the powers of evil, whom in the Christian tradition is either called Satan or demons. And so the devil, uh, we've, having, I'm sure you've met him if you've read scripture carefully, he appears from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden as a spiritual uh, entity that is basically sheer malice and envy and tries to slow down our journey. And this is the way it was conceived in Anthony's time. And in that time, actually, not only in the Christian community, but the whole culture was very conscious of demons of one kind or another. It was, it, was a, it was part of the popular mentality. In any case, here is the sentence. The devil, the hater and envier of good, could not bear to see such resolution in a young man, but set about employing his customary tactics against him. So customary tactics means there's a program. And, and the program consists of testing out the, the uh, neophyte on the spiritual journey to see what his or her weak point is, and then pressing hard at that weak point in order to persuade them for whatever reason, and any reason will do, to give up the spiritual journey and to return to our ordinary occupations as if there was no call to further growth and to divine union. In other words, the, the envier of good wants us to get off this trail of following Christ, off the journey, and to go back to the self-made or homemade self, you might say, of the false self system. So one day, Anthony was living at the edge of town now in some shack, I suppose, looking out the window at a dump, I suppose. The local garbage dump was there, and the rats running around through the dump, and maybe a few uh, bag ladies or gentlemen uh, fishing through the remains. And it was a kind of a drizzle, let us suppose. And uh, the, the springtime has moved a little beyond the flower period, and, and, and some of his interior consolations, enthusiasm, is beginning to droop, sadly, a little bit. And he's a little hungry from having fasted all morning. And, and suddenly his imagination, we've studied the imagination, the various boats that come down the stream of consciousness when we quiet the mind. And so in solitude, the mind is fairly quiet after a few months, uh, maybe six months he might have been there. And so, so, and so onto that <laughs> stream of consciousness, the demon is represented as floating various boats with the purpose of, of capturing Anthony's attention and reminding him of various ways, of various uh, things he had that were so nice in his earlier life, which he's left behind, and to try to invite him to return. And so the first boat, it's really a grocery list, so it doesn't matter where you begin, but it usually covers all the bases for this ascetic because he isn't quite sure where the weak spot is. And so the first thing Anthony started thinking of was the memory of his property. And so into his imagination, he saw once again this the fertile land, this beautiful property by the Nile. And now the sun was setting over the Nile, and the waters are glistening, and the palm trees are swaying and the whippoorwills, or whatever they are, are singing. <laughs> and uh, it's at the close of the day when the noise of the farm machinery has quieted down. Everything is so peaceful. And now some stringed instruments seem to come into his ear. <laughs> and, and the smell of flowers, hyacinth or something. Sight, smell, 
touch, hearing, they all combine to, to bring about this intense nostalgia in Anthony for that beautiful property and those lovely summer evenings or whatever it might have been. And then uh, a voice seems to say, oh, Anthony, how could you have left that beautiful property? You'll never see it again. It's still there. It's not too late. You can still buy it back. Leave right now and go and get it. This is the way that the thoughts progress as one hears this baloney. Now the demon or the spiritual entity of evil, whatever it is, 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 is a magnificent producer or stage manager. Cecil B. DeMille is just a child compared to this stuff. He unites all the senses and, and uh, calls on all the most tender memories and then plays on the emotions in order to get the maximum impression into us. Of, and then, remember, the more the impression, the more the expression. <laughs> and so by deeply impressing us with the mistake we've made, he, he elicits a profound decision to give up the spiritual journey. Now, we're dealing, of course, with uh, Anthony in his particular environment and state of life. So I leave to each one of you to translate these various uh, temptations to return to worldliness, which is what it is, uh, to your own imagination and experience. Notice it's not the world as such that Anthony has left, because it's worldliness that is the, the attachment to self-centered programs for happiness, which is his false self-center. Next thought, that Anthony didn't, uh, was determined to let the property go, so he didn't pay any attention to that boat or series of that flotilla that circled around uh, his property with all the flag waving and banners. And now comes the thought of intimacy with his friends and relatives. Now that he's in the ascetic life, it might not be inappropriate anymore to be able to speak intimately with some of the old friends. In fact, the old friends, if he had any, and none are reported, he was such a, kind of a loner as a child, but he must have had a few friends. Now they've heard of his ascetic journey, and they don't want to go near him, <laughs> because he's challenging them by just the life he's leading. So. A good way of losing most of your friends is, is to start the spiritual journey. <laughs> and so you can use a lot of relatives that way too. So anyway, especially the, if you're serious, he, he thinks, no longer will I be able to, to see my little sister so freely. She's being taken care of by these nuns. and uh, I've given up everything, my cousins and so on. So no more affectionate embraces, no more family affairs, and no more birthday parties. Well, all the most poignant things that we always enjoyed come to mind. Again, Anthony remained firm, and that flotilla floated on downstream. Remember, every boat will float downstream because this is a, in time, our consciousness is in time, and the current takes everything along. Now, here's a peculiar one. Greed for money. Now, we know that Anthony, utmost generosity, had given everything away, even his last nickel that he had thought of using to support his little sister. Now, here he is <laughs> in this shack, and the thought of money is it coming. Think, keep that in mind. So, no matter how generous one may be, uh, these thoughts continue to arise. Now, the next one was greed for power. Now here's this young man who never had any authority or power, and he's feeling the attraction to control other people. Perhaps the thought comes, this mysterious, whispery, and insidious voice is saying, Oh, Anthony, if only you had stayed where you were and perhaps taken a job in the local fertilizer company or whatever they had, <laughs> You would now be a junior executive, and perhaps even a senior executive. And uh, in a little while, you would have been the president of the company. 
you would have been in charge of all the fertilizing plants of Egypt, and maybe you would have become a multinational. It goes on and on and on. So if, like that dear little monkey we spoke about sooner, you don't let go promptly of this kind of thought, then it, it gets more and more of a commentary, more grandiose, more absurd but also more attractive and fascinating, more all-absorbing. And especially if you give into it a little bit, it tends to come back again, because now it has a kind of beachhead in your imagination, and uh, whatever is lodged there with some attachment, it's easier to come back to it. Now comes the love of fame. These are fantastic. These are so totally different from the whole direction that Anthony was going in. How could it be possible for him to have these things? We think of Anthony as the, one of the greatest saints there ever was. Well, he's just having the same temptations you and I are, uh, have almost every day, or did have almost every day, or will have tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> the love of fame. Well, I don't know what form that took. Let's move on to the amenities of life. That is to say, this, the, the, the soft music, uh, the hi-fi sets, the movies, the traveling, the barbecues behind the, uh, the kitchen with the family there and the delicious roasts. Uh, it, it's, it all sort of went by. Whatever was most charming in his early life as an, as, as an amenity. Now, in our day, I imagine traveling is is one of the big things for folks on the spiritual journey. If it is, uh, uh, there's a remedy for this, a pilgrimage. <laughs> it's, a way, it's a way of having both worlds, both traveling and the spiritual journey. But for people coming into a monastery, I can tell you that this is one of the biggies. And, and when you tell them that they're going to stay in that monastery in the same place for the whole of their life, the same people, they just turn pale. <laughs> and, well, anyway, now comes the pleasures of eating. Here's a young man who never uh, had dainties in his, in his well-to-do household, and now is fasting, on, you know, which means one meal a day in those days, and very simple food, perhaps just bread and water. And now the thoughts come floating by of the good old days. Those delicious crocodile burgers <laughs> at, the, uh, at the local <laughs> concession. And now the, all the fleet, the whole flotilla comes down all at once, like the United States Navy. All the boats are sailing by, and each one is waving its charm. It's, it's just devastating. And the bottom line is always the same. Anthony, don't delay you must leave. Don't even think about it. Go back home, go back to your career, go back to your friends, etc., etc. And so here is this poor monk in this old shack, maybe made out of corrugated uh, <laughs> number 10 cans, looking out at this garbage pan and just hanging on. He doesn't even have a table or a chair. He's <laughs> hanging to the wall and saying, and, and what is his, his method? It's all his method of resisting these worldly temptations, which are really not out there but in him, is the same. Faith, determination to stick it out, and incessant prayer. In other words, help, help, help. It's the best, one of the best prayers ever invented. It's very short, it's easy to say, help, help, and, and you can... <laughs> <laughs> you can vary it by saying, help, or help! <laughs> that's, that's the way to do it. Same word, you don't have to think. But that's all you really have to do. <laughs> and I think that life would be easier in time of temptation if you just forgot about uh, how well-behaved you should be, how to resist these temptations with careful reading and certain things. All you have to do is put up with it and say, help. Okay. Now, Anthony... Uh, <laughs> by his determination, and boy, he was determined. The world could have ended. He wasn't going to give up the spiritual journey. This is his great message to those on the journey in our time. You never give up, and you have never give up your trust in God, and you keep 
praying. Incessant prayer becomes a habit. Then it's incessant. In these things, it can be buried, it seems, under this barrage of, of boats. Now, the demon was a little nonplussed by the resolution of this young man. We saw it already had caused him some concern, because he knew that if this guy gets away from these temptations, he's going to cause plenty of trouble to his domain, his spiritual ascendancy over the Christian and human family in that part of the world and perhaps throughout the world. Now, when the positive attraction to return to the pleasant things of the world doesn't work, the demon has another card up his sleeve which is even more insidious and malicious. And it comes down to this to attract us to leave our resolution to take up the spiritual journey under the illusion, well documented as a possibility that it will be a success, of a better good. So for the most generous people, it's not so much the raw attraction to return to the legitimate pleasures of life and, and to forget the spiritual journey and to settle for a respectable mediocrity. Then the demon suggests a better good, a reason why you would be so much better off, so much more generous, so much more faithful, dutiful, if you did something else. So to dislodge us from our uh, resolution, he goes to great straits. So now Anthony's sigh of relief, those boats have floated on down, suddenly becomes aware of another boat, kind of flat, and unassuming, you wouldn't have any suspicions of it. And it would read something like this. Again, the whispering voice of the evil one saying, as this boat comes into focus in his imagination, Anthony, what have you done? You put your sister with those austere, gloomy, horse-faced women. Oh. <laughs> with their illusion of piety. They're a bunch of old witches. They're beating up your dear sister every day. They won't let her play with her dolls. She's crying her heart out. And you did it. You must leave instantly and rescue her from this terrible situation. Now this, this temptation is a dirty trick if there ever was one. And you don't know what to do with it. I can tell you a few other stories uh, from, from uh, my experience in the monastery. There was one novice there who, whose mother used to write regularly saying, if you don't come home, I will commit suicide. Oh. Imagine getting that on a dark day and, and repeated. Well, he stayed and she's still alive. <laughs> in any case, <laughs> it also happened to me. I had uh, uh, had such a sweet grandma who kind of doted on me because I was given the name of her deceased husband. And so we used to go to the opera together. She cultivated my uh, uh, ascetical tastes. Aesthetical, I'd say. Excuse me. <laughs> no, she didn't cultivate me. <laughs> and and uh, she, was, she was not a Catholic, so she couldn't understand my conversion at all and my interest in spiritual things. And when I entered the monastery, it was just the end for her. She had been brought up in one of those Protestant traditions where uh, monks were and nuns were absolute no-nos and where they were filled with these, with these horror tales of, of finding baby skulls between these underground cloisters between men and women monasteries that were too close and things like that. So her idea of monks was one of the last stages of degeneracy of the, of the Catholic communion. And some of those stories, I understand, are now being resurrected in some quarters. They always have a certain fascination, I guess, for some people. But uh, monks are like everybody else. They have their ups and downs, but they don't usually engage in, in murder. Okay. Well, anyway, here, <laughs> here, here is this poor dear lady uh, in her last illness, and she had a trained nurse with her most of the time, and she's, uh, she was in an apartment in New York. She had never gotten the courage to come to see me, which was allowed maybe once or twice a year only. 
But she had gotten as far as the Pennsylvania Station, or was it the Grand Central Station, when my mother came to see me, to see them off. That was as close as she could come. Well, one day I get this letter from her in which she says, Dear grandson, uh, I'm lying here in this, uh, in this room, bedridden, and I uh, miss you so terribly. I still hope that you'll come home. And I say to my nurse, if my grandson won't come home, won't you please throw me out of the window? <laughs> <laughs> well, you ask yourself then, is, uh, can I justify, how can I justify causing such suffering to the people who love me the most? It really uh, sifts your vocation. So if you came into the monastery because you wanted to be a farmer or a liturgist or live in the country or uh, get away from it all, I don't know. These motives don't last very long when this stuff begins, believe me. And, and so the, 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 the question rises, why have you come and are you going to stay in the face of this difficulty? Now, I, I imagine that happens to uh, lay folks on the journey when, especially in the family, some member of the family, especially one spouse, uh, has no sympathy for the journey. And so when you come home uh, from work in the evening uh, and uh, head for the cellar or the, wherever you do your centering prayer for a few minutes, well, then your spouse naturally says, well, what's wrong with me? And when you come out, she says, this. <laughs> How can you do this to me? Don't you love me anymore? I've been waiting for you all day. And then you disappear into the cellar as soon as you come home to sit there, whatever the heck you're doing. So there's a subtle jealousy that begins to take over. And, and, and it, there can be a lot of backbiting. And, and so so that this really is a great problem. And the question arises, uh, is, is my marriage going to fall apart because of my is God asking me to, to uh, uh, in, in the name of the spiritual journey, to get a divorce or something? Of course not. This, this is so important to remember, that the daily life with our commitments is the arena where the spiritual journey takes place. The exercises that help us to deepen our intimacy with God enable us to perceive daily life as a gold mine of transformation, so that you don't lead the spiritual journey by leaving your commitments. And sometimes the two seem to be irreconcilable. Then you have to pray and do the best you can. But there are ways of doing this. You have to negotiate. You should not wave the red flag in front of an indignant anti-meditator. <laughs> It won't work. But you could possibly negotiate. I don't say this will always work. At an appropriate time, you can assure them that God is not in competition for human love. And it's true. The more we love our spouses, our families, our friends, the more God loves, likes it. And, and the more love he'll give us to do so. The divine love is a spiritual love that is manifested by showing it, yes, but it's not sentimental. It's not human love. It's not in competition. Rather, it supports it, and human love is to be the manifestation or the ministry of that divine love to those to whom we have some bond of blood and are committed to. And uh, so here, you might take your spouse at a peaceful moment by the hand and say, look, you, you, like, to, you like me to sit in front of the television watching the programs for three or four hours. I'll be glad to do that, but as long as you won't be annoyed if I take my two periods of half an hour, let's, uh, usually there's some area, you know, of, of, of uh, reasonable uh, give and take if one works at it. This much is sure, whatever the situation, you cannot walk away from the spiritual journey under any circumstances. On the other hand, you cannot walk away from your commitments either, unless they're absolutely uh, dissolving for other reasons. So the, the, actually your spiritual journey, if you are prudent and not naive or, or, uh, and consider the other persons and not try to change them and work with them, you can usually develop some kind of program. And if you change, which you will after, for the better hopefully, after a few months, 
your family will begin to say to you, you're not quite as edgy as you used to be. In fact, you smile a little more often. And I'm not as afraid of you as I was before. And you seem more peaceful. And so if they see you improving as a person in concrete life, they begin to back off a little bit. So you may not find the solution right away, but if you live with it and work with it, then, then this opposition finally resolves itself. And the opposition itself is sometimes part of the journey because it makes us sift our motivation. And also to act uh, not uh, precipitously, like some people who are very devoted in their early period of conversion will go out to a prayer meeting every night. Well, naturally the family feel lost. Where they've got to <laughs> balance the time and, and, uh, and their, the pleasure that one feels like Anthony in the springtime of his spiritual life must not be presumed to be present in other people and hence their feelings have to be considered. Well, uh, let's, let's imagine some other uh, scenarios for, for this encouragement to leave our resolution for a better good. It, it could take another form. Uh, in a monastery, it might run something like this. Dear soul, <laughs> sometimes the, uh, this voice kind of fawns on you. Um, you were studying to be a doctor. Doctors are very needed today. Why don't you leave and continue your career? You could serve people so much more thoroughly. Or again, your mother and father are fighting as usual. You're the only one who ever was able to bring a little peace in the home. How can you stay here when if you would return, everything would be peaceful again? Or again, dad, your dad, as you know, is alcoholic. He came, on, he came onto the wagon for you at your persuasion. Now you're not around. He's about to return to his cups. Hurry home and you can rescue him from a relapse. Again, you're your mother's one and only child. She's sitting at home, the tears are streaming down her cheeks. How can you do this to her? Or again, your old flame is sitting in a furnished room, biting her nails, tearing her hair. Her heart is breaking. She's think considering suicide or maybe turn to drink. She's about to shoot some cocaine. <laughs> you must go home. <laughs> How can you do this? Actually, she's met a wonderful guy, was never happier, and is about to get married, and hasn't given you another thought. Okay. <laughs> you see, the demon never suggests the other side or the other possibility. And he builds up this huge smoke screen to make it difficult to do so, so that all we see in the imagination, the emotions, are filled with this baloney, this false front, this stage production, which is fascinating, absorbing, but is completely empty inside. It has no substance to it. Now, now this, this teaching of letting go of these temptations doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with those things in themselves, most of them at least. They're the legitimate pleasures of life. And, 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 and we'll return to some of them, even on the spiritual journey at times. The point is they're being used to get us to desist from the spiritual journey. That's the strategy. And sometimes it may be useful to allow oneself, as Bernie did, a few enjoyments in order to prove that you can, <laughs> that you can <laughs> enjoy those things without having to give up the spiritual journey and go home. In other words, uh, who said you couldn't uh, enjoy a, 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 a hot fudge sundae or something? <laughs> And, and you don't have to leave the monastic order, at least anymore, to have one. <laughs> okay, now, now, now the demon, don't think he's about to be nonplussed. He's, he's, he's very resourceful, whoever this creature or critter is. And so he was not able to fascinate Anthony by positive attractions back to uh, his former way of life. So now he tries some negative feelings. He tries to insinuate a negative attitudes towards the difficult ascetical life or the spiritual journey that Anthony has embraced. 
And now we get some other boats coming down the stream, and these are kind of forbidding. These are all armed to the teeth and dark and ugly. And the first one suggests weakness of the body. In other words, Anthony, how in the world do you expect to live this way? How do you expect, when you go home uh, from this retreat, if he was talking to you folks, <laughs> to get up an hour earlier every morning, to do centering prayer for the rest of your life. You'll, you'll be sick. You'll overdo it. You'll be in a mental hospital, etc. <laughs> the answer to that is baloney. And so d the next one is duration of time. How can you keep up this dismantling of the fault system? How can you give up all your innate desires for controlling others? which are so reasonable since you really are a superior person. How can you give up that fundamental need of human life for security? You deserve it. You've earned it. And, and, and uh, are you going to forget all, all that stuff in, in order to let go of your security needs and be poor in spirit? You're just dumb. Well, anyway, whatever, whatever the the message is, it's usually well tailored to our own lifestyle, personal history, and, and vulnerability. The, the rigor of virtue uh, and the duration of time, the great labor of practicing virtue, all of these are kind of separate boats that come down and may take different forms. And one of those forms might, were, such as the, as the at trial that I described when I was not able to <laughs> avoid being jealous of this monk who was praying in church all the time. Well, while that was going on, it came time for me to make a final commitment uh, uh, to the order. And, and that meant the question, how, how are you going to live with this person for the next 50 or 60 years? I mean, that's reasonable thought. Or if you're in a community or family, where, or organization where this thought keeps coming up. Uh, I can't get on with this person no matter what I've done. Uh, well, how are you going to make a commitment there for 10, 20, or 30 years? These are the thoughts that arise. Well, in each one, Anthony always returned to his basic response, the determination not to go off from the spiritual journey, trust that God would give him the power not to run away, and incessant prayer, whatever form was appropriate at the time. As our presentation of this first temptation of Anthony to return to his experience of worldliness, please notice that all those thoughts are coming from the fault self-center, firmly in place, still resistant to his superficial efforts in the springtime of his spiritual life, and it's on those programs that the demon calls upon to respond to his invitations. In other words, the problem is still in Anthony. He is still has those programs on the unconscious level, and it's to those values that these thoughts appeal. And I might add as a final word, they recycle. <laughs> Thank you.